living through a time when race has been overemphasized in society. As history has shown us, this usually doesn't end well for civilization. Ironically, the safeguards that have been constructed to prevent racism, things like critical race theory and racial sensitivity training, seem to be creating more racism, not less. White people and black people from the youngest years in academia to the workforce are being told that white supremacy has roots in not only the founding of America, but every aspect of our lives and every institution. But is this really true? No matter what our race is, should everything we do be viewed through a lens of race and racism? This is a conversation I've been wanting to have for a while, and I thought that Black History Month was the perfect time to have it. Because no matter your background, Black, White, Hispanic, Asian, Indigenous, the idea that we're living in a society that is rigged against people of color is imperative to look into. Because if it's true, it needs to be corrected right away. But if it's not true, we need to discover who's pushing these lies, and more importantly, why? My guest today is a speech language pathologist, writer, Christian, father, husband, and launched his podcast in 2020 called Informed Dissent, where he pushes back on dogmatic groupthink for Black Americans and advocates for a post-racial society. He has a brand new book out now called Raising Victims. Please welcome Leonidas Johnson to The Spillover. Leonidas, your podcast, which is called Informed Dissent, really pushes back, you say, against the culture of groupthink and challenges the narrative. But what I find interesting about you is that you say you were always interested in politics or really cared. So what changed for you? Yeah, I, I, I was pretty apolitical my whole life. I didn't really care about politics, didn't pay attention to politics. I, I actually voted for Obama twice, if you can believe that or not. <laughs> It wasn't until uh, the Michael Brown issue in Ferguson when I started really paying attention to what was going on in the news. And it, it was this like light bulb moment, like, oh my gosh, like they are not telling the truth about what's happening. And then they're blatantly lying. Like he didn't have his hands up. They're not telling the truth about this guy's past history. And so I started looking into things and looking into what else the media was lying to us about. Turns out, Alex, it was quite a bit. They lied to us about quite a lot of stuff. So and it wasn't anything that ever really was in, of interest to me, but it kind of happened because I, I find the race thing to be so emotionally driving. And it's in my perspective is that race shouldn't matter. And that, you know, I, I have all kinds of friends and family from different uh, backgrounds and different racial, racial groups. And for me, it just didn't matter. And so to make it so such a central aspect of identity and for the media to push these narratives and to divide people by race. That's when I started really paying attention and started really looking into things. So uh, it, it kind of happened by accident, but it was, uh, it, it was my guy, which if I had to pick a point, it was the Michael Brown case in Ferguson. That was the real impetus when I started to pay attention. Before your eyes were open during the whole Michael Brown situation, did you ever feel as a black man in America that you were at a disadvantage to other people or no? You know, I growing up, there was a little bit of that infused into me. And um, it, you have this kind of idea that because you're black, that negative things that happen to you are automatically due to race. And that's kind of a, a perpetual cultural thing that happens. And there's a lot of black people that think that way. And I grew up that way with a lot of people infusing that, nor there's my friends or some uh, extended family that were infusing these ideas. And I'll give you an example. Um, I, I was cut from my baseball team. Well, that is, is my sophomore year. And I, I was so devastated because I felt like the reason I didn't make it was because I was black, because my coach was racist, because it had something to do with skin color, and it had nothing to do with my ability, my my ability to play baseball, had nothing to do with my practice regimen or my work ethic. It was definitely because of because of my race. And other people reinforced that. They they came in, they said, "Oh yeah, this, he doesn't like black people or, or whatever." It didn't matter that you know other black people had played for him or you know that sort of thing. There, the logic just wasn't there. It was a very emotional argument. So there was a little bit of that growing up until I started to really question things for myself and really think about the world in a more objective way. 
And again, you know, I, I was, I was pretty apolitical. I wasn't very involved. I wasn't like an activist or anything like that. I wasn't out with my fist raised and saying, uh, Viva La Revolution. I wasn't that kind of, that kind of person. But at the same time, there was still those, that internalized sort of victimhood as I was growing up that I had to break out of. So there was a little bit of it. Yeah, absolutely. Could you describe the domino effect of, okay, I discovered the Michael Brown stuff was a lie, then I discovered this was a lie, and then this was a lie. What was that like for you realizing, oh, the media has lied to me so much as a Black voter for the last several decades? Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to use the word that you wake up because, because of the association with woke, but that's what it was like. It was like waking up from, from a dream. And you're like, oh my gosh, like everything I thought about the world, everything that I thought was true was, was completely backward. And, you know, I think, like I said, I voted for Obama and I thought that he was going to be this great, uh, this great bridge and move us into the, uh, the, this realm of racial harmony. And once I realized what was actually happening, it was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. And I'll tell you, one of my friends put me on to a, a guy named Thomas Sowell, and I'm sure you've heard of him. He's, he's now one of my favorite people in the world, my favorite thinkers, economists, philosophers. And I started to read some of his books and read some of his insight into the racial issues and, and uh, discrimination, disparities. Um, things like that. And he really opened my eyes and really enlightened me in, in what was going on. So, uh, yeah, the more that I looked into it, whether, whether we're talking about the race, race issues, whether we're talking about, um, economic issues, uh, whatever the media was talking about, they had a very specific leftist slant to it and, or they were outright lying. And so once you start that, once you really open your eyes to what's happening in the media and the, the deception that's happening, uh, you start to see it everywhere and it, it it's hard to ignore but before when i was pretty apolitical you know you kind of trust that they're telling you the truth and you're kind of naive about it right you, you're like oh well cnn said this so clearly that's true right like that cop definitely shot that guy and so cnn told us it was racism so i'm going to believe that but once you start digging and looking into it yourself you're like oh okay like they're not telling us the whole story and they're leaving out key de details in order to shape the narrative. And so those kind of tactics have really turned me off to the media, turned me off to politicians, and uh, made me passionate about pursuing this, uh, I guess you could call it racial harmony and a movement toward a post-racial society. Yeah. So your investigative work led you to really looking into critical race theory, which is now the popularized term um, about, you know, teaching kids about racial equity and all these different types of things. It kind of started on an academic level, but now it's really trickled into all of our major institutions, even our workplaces across America. And your new book yep. really goes into this. So um, I have like hard hitting questions for you to debunk about <laughs> some of the stuff that critical race theory proclaims. But first, kind of yeah. tell us what critical race theory is and uh, what you've discovered about it. So critical race theory is an ideology that was developed throughout the 70s and the 80s. And it started in law school. And that's an argument you'll hear a lot like, oh, critical race theory is only in law schools. It's not in public schools or, or, or whatever. And it did. It did start in law school. And the idea was to develop it from critical legal theories and to apply race as an element to discover how the legal system was impacting minorities and causing racial disparities in the criminal justice system. That's what the stated proposition was. And since then, it has expanded into all different disciplines, and it's basically oppression Olympics. Now, the way I normally describe critical race theory is based on its presuppositions, which, yeah, a lot of times it's a moving target because if you try to define critical race theory, the people who support it will say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not critical race theory. And then they'll change the terminology to diversity, equity, and inclusion, or anti-racism or, or something else in order to try to obfuscate and, and throw you off the set. But the basic presuppositions of critical race theory is that, is that racism is endemic in our society. It's everywhere at all times interwoven into the very fabric of our institution that mean everything that everything in our lives can be viewed through the lens of racism and white supremacy though so your your job you're going to school us sitting here having this podcast conversation 
can be viewed through the lens of white supremacy because everything is imbibed with racism in, in our society. And what that comes from is that this guy named uh, Antonio Gramsci, who was an Italian Marxist, who developed this idea called cultural hegemony, which basically means that the elite in power have this system that they create that perpetuates privilege and status for them. And then everybody else is basically oppressed de facto. And they oppress themselves because it's the status quo, it's the normal way of operation. They don't even realize that they're being oppressed. They're just, that's just the normal way that they live their lives. And so that's why you get ideas. And I try to get people to understand this. That's why you get bizarre ideas like five black police officers in Memphis, Tennessee, beating up a, a, a black man and killing him. And then the media comes out and says that this is an example of white supremacy. Yeah, so it, on the surface, you're like, how could you say that? How could you say that five black men beating up another black guy and killing him is an example of white supremacy? It's because they have this Marxist ideology where everything in society is viewed through the lens of white supremacy. Everything is infused with white supremacy. So it doesn't matter if you're black or, or, or white or Asian or whatever. If something negative happens, then it can be attributed to white supremacy. There's racial disparities. If, if kids aren't doing as well in school, you have police shootings, uh, wealth gaps. I mean, pick pick a topic, and it, it's all indicative of white supremacy. And you can't you can't prove it wrong, so it's unfalsifiable. So, if I was going to say the basics of critical race theory, that's what it would be. Racism's everywhere at all times, and it's an interwoven into the fabric of our society. Yeah, it all really sounds kind of like it's part of the playbook of BLM. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, BLM is it, it, it's a natural out, outcrop of the, um, critical race theory. And, you know, what, one of the one things that they do, and I'm glad you brought up BLM because it's a good example, but one of the things that people who support critical race theory do is they, they play word games. And Black Lives Matter is something that most people would agree with, right? Most people would say, yes, of course, Black Lives Matter. Anti-racism. Most people would say, yes, I'm I'm anti-racism. I don't like racism. I don't support racism. But what they do is they hide the more extreme radical ideas underneath the the uh, the more agreeable terminology. So they'll say, oh, like you don't if you don't agree that all white people are racist or that we need to pay reparations or that uh, the system is in, is imbibed with white supremacy. If you don't believe those things, then you don't believe that Black Lives Matter. And they tried to connect the two. It's like, wait a minute, I, I didn't say, I didn't say all that. I just don't agree with the extreme stuff. Of course, I agree with Black Lives Matter, but it's one way that critical race theory infuses itself in our society: diversity, equity, and inclusion. Another way, right? And most people would think diversity is a good word, right? Most of us would say, yeah, I agree. We, we should have diversity. We should have inclusion. We should have, you know, we should have equality. Equity sounds like equality, um, but most people would agree with those things. But they're actually just ways to sneak in the ideology and uh, hide the extremism, hide the radical elements of the ideology. And, and you know, if you disagree with it, then they'll say, oh, so you're just a bigot who doesn't agree with diversity. And that's just not the case at all. But yeah, the Black Lives Matter is a great example of that because, uh, you know, they push those ideas. And every time there's a police shooting or something like that, uh, they're always latching on to well it's definitely racism i mean the whole george floyd thing i even to this day there's still not a lick of evidence alex that that had anything to do with racism and yet we're still supposed to march locked up and uh you know acknowledge that this was indicative of white supremacy and a racist tweet system and it's just it, it's nonsense and for anybody who would take a second to think about it The main demographic that listens to the spillover is females 25 to 35 years old. And obviously there are some men who listen, but predominantly if you're listening right now, you likely fall into that age range and you're likely married. So if that's you, or if you are one of the dude servatives who loves this podcast, thank you, by the way, I'm very flattered. I have a really exciting experience to tell you about. Turning Point USA is doing a men's leadership event for the first time. It's called The Summit. 
summit. And the reason behind why we at TPUSA decided to do this is pretty simple. Now more than ever, masculinity is under attack. The summit is physically, emotionally, and spiritually challenging. The summit pushes you to your limit and then a little further. And the mission is to revive the masculine heart and to develop purpose-driven men who are leaders ready to serve their God, their family, and their nation. There's hiking, shooting, ice baths, camping, learning survival skills, prayer, fellowship, and of course, lots of food. Men ages 16 to 40 can sign up to attend the summit happening in cities across the United States. You can find a location near you and get more info at summit.tpusa.com. They'll also help you find which summit event is going to be good for your age range. That's summit.tpusa.com. So whether you're a guy looking to make lasting friendships or you're a woman who happens to have a man in your life, tell him to sign up for the summit. Well, you brought up something that I think is a very important point to make. The word equity sounds so good. That sounds like equality, right? Equity, equality, they must be the same thing, but actually they're very different. Could you explain um, the main difference between something like equality and equity? Sure. Equity is the opposite of equality. Equality is, you think of equality like everybody has an equal opportunity to succeed. Uh, whereas equity is attempting to make outcomes equal. So you're you're looking for equality on the other end of things. And the only way that you can achieve this, this sense of equity is by inequality, by treating people unequal. You have to try to manipulate people and manipulate the lovers in order to try to make equal outcomes. And this this sense of egalitarianism is is always fraught with uh just it's always fraught with purity it's always fraught with force because the only way that you can achieve those which for one thing it's not achievable at all you can't achieve equal outcomes it can't happen but the only way you can even try to is by trying to force everybody to be equal in my book i talk about the short story of harris and bergeron and how the people in that society were forced to be equal but the only way they could do that is if they were handicapped. So like the ballerinas had to wear weight. So they weren't too graceful. They weren't more graceful than other people. Uh, had, if people had a pleasant voice, they had to change their voice and make it real raspy and nasty. Um, if people were too intelligent, they had to wear a radio that disrupted their thoughts. Uh, and that's the only way it can happen. It can only happen to, by knocking people down. Um, Equity is a concept that has no interest in lifting people up. It doesn't look at people who are falling behind and say, you know what? We need to give these people um, extra help or we need to give them tutoring if they're in school, whatever. It, it looks at the people who are doing better and say, we need to do something to knock them down and make everybody equal. So that's why you see schools that get rid of advanced classes if there's not enough black and brown students in the classes. That's why you could see like in New York, they tried to get rid of the honor roll because there weren't enough black and brown students getting onto the honor roll. So, <laughs> But Leonidas, just, the left it, would say there. to you, the left would say, well, see, there's not a lot of black and brown students in advanced courses because everything is rigged and racist against them. So how right. would you respond to that? Right. Yeah, that's exactly what they would say. And I always bring up the concept of uh, Baltimore City Schools. And Baltimore City Schools is mostly black as far as student body, uh, as far as uh, school board, as far as the superintendent. Uh, even if you go out to look at the city itself, but most of the city council is black, um, the mayor is black, the police chief is black, et cetera, et cetera. So Baltimore is mostly run by black people. And yet Baltimore City Schools, it has abysmal outcomes, any abysmal outcomes. And it's one of the highest funded schools in the country and yet you have schools in that system where less than 1% of their students are proficient in math and reading. And, and, and yet you look at some of those schools and they have like really low proficiency rates and yet really high graduation rates. Like, well, like, I wouldn't say really high, but like 70% are still graduating. But you have all of this stuff happening in a system that's mostly run by black people. And so you, you ask the question like, okay, so if racial disparities are automatically indicative of racism, 
why would it happen in a system that's mostly run by black people? And and they would say the same thing still. They would say that's still indicative of white supremacy, even though it's the same thing as the black cops in Memphis. Like, even though it's involving mostly black people, it's still indicative of white supremacy. So it, it's a theory that just cannot, it can't be falsified because no matter how much evidence you provide against it, they just say that that's actually evidence to support to support the theory that's actually evidence to, su to, to show that i'm right even though i'm wrong that just shows how right i am well that's so, what's so it's, hard it's, it's like it's what is you're always running in circles trying to debate yeah. liberals on the issue of race yeah I, well i tell you i've had people tell me even i i've, I've shown people statistics of uh, police shooting and um I'm, just real quick i'll say that if you break down police shootings and and you control for violent crime rate and you look at different populations based on the violent crime rate, then police actually are more likely to shoot and kill white suspects. Not a lot. It's, it's a very small percentage, but it, it's, it's almost even. But there's a slight, the more, a slight higher likelihood that police will shoot and kill white suspects once you control for violent crime. Now, when I show people those statistics uh, that, that support critical race theory or Black Lives Matter or whatever, that's what they tell me. They, they tell me, no, the statistics are racist. <laughs> so, no, the statistics aren't. You can't trust the, the statistics. They're racist. It's white. It's all white supremacy. It's your. In fact, they, they accuse me of having internalized white supremacy, and <laughs> so it's just yeah. It it it's hard to win uh, those kind of debates, and it's almost fruitless because it, again, it, it's like talking to somebody who believes the Earth is flat. And, it <laughs> you know, is. You can show them pictures. And you can show them all the proof in the world and they'll tell you that it's just a lie. It's all just this big conspiracy to make you think that the earth is actually a globe. Uh, and they, you, there's just no convincing them once they're that ideologically committed to it. So okay, well, it this is, is frustrating. This is fun for me. I want to continue down just the myth busting. All right. So are you ready? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Okay. Was America founded on racism and stolen land as the left claims? Oh man. So, <laughs> so I don't know if you're aware of this, but actually Native Americans and everybody who was non-white was living in perfect harmony with rainbows and butterflies and, and care bears running around until white people showed up and killed everybody. I don't know if you're, that's the yeah. true history. Well, that's true. <laughs> people are like, wait. No, I mean, it's just, that i mean it's these these people just have no they have no grasp of actual history and they 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 have to think that way right they have to believe that evil never showed up in history until white people showed up in america or or white people showed up anywhere and because that's how they view it and it's funny because they always talk about the need to decenter whiteness and, but everything they talk about has to do with white people as the central focus. Every you look at history with now white people. Now that you say that, focus. you are so right. I never thought about that before. They're always like, we want to get white people out of the equation, and yet everything is about white people. Everything, even <laughs> even the term per, even the term people of color <laughs> denotes either you're white or you're not white. Like there's that's the dichotomy. Uh, which is funny for people that say they're non-binary because it's, you know, non-white or not white. That's, that's all you have. That's your, those are your choices. But yeah, and everything has to be viewed through that lens. But I mean, listen, there, there were horrible things that happened in the past. I think we all can acknowledge that. I think we all can acknowledge that the his, our history is not clean and it's, you know, it's not a fan. We, we don't try to sanitize it and say, yeah, actually slavery was a great thing. It was awesome. You know, but what people need to recognize is that slavery was not unique to America. Uh, slavery was something, slavery is an institution that has existed for thousands of years and was, and it was a normal thing for human history. And up still until does. The time, still exists. And still does. Yeah, and still does. And for certain parts of the world, uh, certain, uh, should I say, non-white parts of the world, which is, which is interesting. And nobody seems to care about that. Nobody seems to talk about it. But... You know, what Thomas Sowell, I, I mentioned Thomas Sowell earlier. Thomas, one thing Thomas Sowell always says is that, you know, it wasn't particularly uh, special that slavery existed. It, it wasn't remarkable that slavery existed. What was remarkable is that we abolished it. That was what was unique. 
because it had existed so long for so, in so many places. And, you know, if you go back through history, just about every group of people has been both slave owners and slaves at some point. So we could all go back into our ancestral heritage and find slave owners or slaves. And this depends on how far you go back. So the idea that slavery is this uniquely American issue is just, it's, it's just wrong. Now, whether America was founded on this idea of white supremacy and racism, and if you want to believe that, then you have to believe that the Constitution and that the ideals of America are, are white supremacists and racists, which critical race theorists do. But you have to believe that things like uh, like equal equality under the law, uh, freedom and liberty, uh, you, you have to believe that these things are, are white supremacist notions, that all men are created equal, that was actually was the, the ide ideology that pushed for the end of slavery. But in order to believe that America was founded on white supremacy, you have to believe that those ideals themselves are racist. And they try. Critical race theorists, they they try to push those ideas and they say that, you know, the enlightenment rationalism, neutral principles of constitutional law, uh, liberty, even the idea of rights themselves, free speech, all of these things are uh purveyors of white supremacy to them. And it's just it, it's just wrong. It's just it's just absolutely incorrect. Because if we live up to those ideals, obviously you can't possibly be racist if you believe those things you can't you can't possibly harbor animosity toward a fellow human being if you believe those things so it's just it, it's just a way for them to to uh create this degenerate sort of image of america and denigrate it and move us into a cultural revolution yes exactly because a lot of people say well i don't understand why they push these lies and that is why yeah. what you just said to push yep. us into a cultural revolution. That's very important to understand. Now, one thing that I hear all the time over and over is that racism in America was was kind of laying dormant. And then President Obama got elected. And then the racists were mad that we had a black president. And then once President Trump got elected in 2016, the racism ramped up. And we finally, you know, all of us racists were able to get it out of our system or whatever. Is there any evidence to say that that's true? Well, one thing you'll find out when we're talking about critical race theory is that evidence is not all that important. It's <laughs> the motion. <laughs> it's the motion that matters. It's how I feel. This is my truth. It's my, I feel like racism, racism was, was imbibed in the Trump presidency. Therefore, it's true. But I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to stick because I do feel like racism got worse after Obama got elected. I think that much is true. Um, but I think the reasoning is different. I, I don't think the reasoning is correct because what happened and, you know, well, first thing I would say is it's an interesting thing for a racist nation to, an, to elect a, a black president, not once, but twice. That's what and my <laughs> response always it's, is. It's an inter yeah, it's an interesting thing for that to happen. If we're so in Biden, white supremacy, if the system is so infused and intertwined with racism, then it is interesting that, that something like that could happen. I cannot believe this happened to me. I met a guy out at the bar. We were both sitting. He was cute. And then when he stood up to leave, he walked with his hands behind his back. Is it too much to ask for a man to be normal? Imagine being a grown man, walking with your hands behind your back like a toddler. My new test when I meet a guy in public is going to be to ask them to do a little walk and find out if they walk normal and if they can grill a proper steak. The two best questions to ask because my freezer is chock full of 100% American made grass fed and grain finished beef from Good Ranchers. Over 85% of grass fed beef is imported from overseas. This hurts the quality of the meat that you eat and the quality of life for American farmers. Buying from independent farmers in the US lets you do good and eat good at the same time, which is possible 
possible by starting a Good Rancher subscription and getting your meat shipped straight to your door. If you prefer chicken, Good Rancher's chicken comes pre-trimmed so that you don't have to do extra work before dinner. They're ready to go right into the pan after you season their plain chicken breasts, or you can use one of their pre-seasoned options for an even easier meal that always delivers juicy cuts of chicken. My favorite part is that Good Rancher's chicken is better than organic. The label of organic, a lot of people don't know this, but it really only refers to the feed that the chicken eats in its life. Good Ranchers goes beyond just the feed to make the whole process better than organic, which is why their chicken blows people away. When you use my code and purchase any Good Ranchers box in February to say, I love you with meat, you'll get $30 off. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Clark and use code Clark for $30 off. That's GoodRanchers.com slash Clark with code Clark for $30 off or just click the link in the description. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. Well, not only elected Obama twice, but also a lot of the same voters that elected Obama ended up then voting for Trump in 2016. Voting for Trump, right. So suddenly they just became, you know, hardcore uh, KKK members. It's out of the blue, apparently. Yeah. But... (laughs) But yeah, I mean, but yeah, once Trump got elected, um, the media had a real sense of animosity toward him. And that and and that's that's the obvious thing to say. I think most people are aware of that. That they they were coming for him however they could. And the race angle, the racism angle, is an easy tool of emotional manipulation. And, you know, what we just talked about, this idea of cultural revolution. One thing people need to understand about critical race theory is that it's not really about race. It's not. It's just that race is a very potent weapon that they can use in order to manipulate people, get them into their emotions, and get them to basically turn against their own country and tear down these institutions. Uh, Gender is the same way. The the gender radicals, they do the exact same thing with gender. Sexuality, same thing. The LGBT activists. It's not really about the thing itself. It's about pushing this this uh, cultural revolution. But yeah, the the whole thing with the media attacking Trump, uh, whether they whether they were just useful idiots or they actually recognized what they were trying to do, um, they I think they just knew that that race was a powerful way to get at him. And and it's hard to defend yourself. That's the other thing too, Ali. Like it, it's hard to defend yourself when somebody accuses you of racism. Uh, I because it you, you basically fall into something called a Kafka trap, and Ibram X Kendi has said this explicitly that if you deny that you're racist, that's just evident that you're racist because obviously racist people are going to deny it. And so, if somebody accuses you of racism and you say, "No, I'm not racist," then I mean, there's not a lot you can say because people are going to use anything you try to use try to say to defend yourself yeah so what should you what's the right answer like what is the best way for a conservative to respond to that that accusation that you're a racist yeah i mean if somebody's going to accuse you of racism i mean there's no response really that you need to have i mean like at that point the conversation is over yeah because what they're trying to do is they're trying to trap you so if you said for instance let me give you an example If, if you say that i'm not racist I have I have black friends. I I have black family members. I I you know I I voted for Obama. Whatever whatever it may be, they're going to use that against you and say that's what racist people say, and that's a microaggression or or, or whatever it may be. So the, the the best thing to do anytime you have that sort of framing is it's it's like the uh, when did you stop beating your wife loaded question, right? So instead of answering the question. You just get rid of the premise itself and say, no, no, we're not doing that. We're not talking, no, I, or, or you can just like, whatever, dude, like <laughs> say what you want to say. I'm, I'm going to go over here and this conversation is over, but playing with them on their grounds is, I mean, playing by their rules and playing their game. It's, it, it's not going to go well because they're just going to continue to play that nonsense where it's like, no matter what you say, it, it's evidence of your guilt. And again, it's like it's the cop the trap mentality, and they do this on purpose so that you can't get out of it. So, I, I wouldn't have had a better answer, but it's just so hard to uh, it's so hard to talk to these people. It's hard to rationalize have a with conversation someone. with rational. 
Yeah. yeah like you, if someone, you know, if somebody's having their emotional reasoning, it's really hard to rationalize with them. Yeah. Does white privilege exist? No, no, not as not as a entity. Now, I, I will say that there are people who probably benefit from their race uh, for being white, but there are also people who benefit from being black. There are people who benefit from being Asian, whatever. They, there are people out there that, I mean, there's such individual situations that, that may occur because, I, you know, racism exists. One thing I'm always accused of is that I'm, I'm arguing that racism doesn't exist. That's not what I'm arguing at all. I'm arguing that racism is not systemic. It's not imbibed in our institution. And it's not everywhere at all times. But individual sin, individual racism, of course, and it's always going to exist. It's always going to be out there in some aspect. So to say that somebody never benefits from being white would be wrong. But again, there's all people have, you could all find an example of all races benefiting for their race. So white, the idea of white privilege itself is nothing more than just a, a, a political cudgel meant to silence people. Because you're not allowed to have an opinion, Alex, if you have white privilege. You can't talk about race. You can't talk about these issues because you're just talking from a place of privilege. You need to be quiet and you need to listen to uh, black and brown voices tell you their lived experience and you need to learn. Except they never want to frame it. But they never want to listen to black and brown voices if they're conservative. That's the kicker. Right. Exactly. Well, it's because I have internalized white supremacy. So. Right. Of course. <laughs> you describe yourself as being an advocate for a post-racial society. What would yeah. that even look like? So a post-racial society is a society that treats skin color as no more consequential to who we are than hair color or eye color. Right. I, I look at people and I see that they have different eye colors and different hair colors, but I don't make judgments about them based on those features. And in a post-racial society, skin color would be treated the same way rather than this sense of collective identity where you look at somebody and you say like, oh, okay, that's a white person that they're, they're part of this collective group that we're going to call white people. And then we're going to make value judgments about them based on that identity, which is the complete opposite of what we should be doing. It, uh, that's what critical race theories theorists want us to do. They want us to see the world that way. They want us to treat each other as as collective racial groups and make value judgments based on those identities. And it's just completely wrong. It's, it's completely opposite to what we should be doing. It's just the it's the Martin Luther King quote, right? They, we judge each other by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. So uh, I, I use the term colorblindness to to um, and to bring this up because it's this idea that, yeah, okay, I see that we have differences. I see that we have different skin colors or we have different eye colors or we have different hair colors or different shape of our earlobes or, or whatever it may be. And, but none of that matters because I'm going to look at your individuality and your unique individual who spans the spectrum of human variation. I'm not going to put you in this collective group, this arbitrary collective group based on your skin color. I'm going to treat you as an individual. So that's the hope. And um, one of the things I always say is that I, I hope with this book and with the movement is that we'll initiate the paradigm shift in our country and start moving toward that. And I feel like we have been and um, hope move more toward it. But it's something that may may not happen in our lifetime. It may not happen this generation or next generation. But I do hope to plant those seeds. And it's the age old proverb, you know, like as society grows great. When uh, old men plant trees under whose shade they know they may never sit. And so you hope, hope to plant those trees and hope to see that in the, in the upcoming generations that where skin color is just, just, as important, just as important to a person's identity as being blonde or, or having blue eyes. Why do you think so many of the people who are leading these social justice causes on behalf of black people aren't even black? <laughs> that's that's a good question and you know it I, I think it has to do a lot with uh this sense of guilt that's been infused into them where they feel like they are a, you know, i think of robin d'angelo specifically uh you, if you read some of her writings you're like was this written by a grand wizard like what like who is this person like she she admits to having animosity toward uh minorities and you know it's like 
she admits to being racist and having these racist thoughts and and then she projects that onto everybody else and, and says well all white people all white people feel like i do uh and, and so i i i think there's some of that but you know on a higher level uh it, as far as like academics go these people are well first of all their bread their bread is buttered by this stuff they they i don't even know that they want to actually reach a point where there is a revolution for some of them because they benefit so much from the conflict you know people like Ibram x kendi they benefit so much from the conflict but then you have the hardcore ideologues the people who really believe this stuff who want to institute a cultural revolution and really up in society and turn it into this communist utopia and whatever they have have in mind and yeah i always bring up uh mao zedong during the chinese cultural revolution and one of the things that he said was that in order to build a new society the old site must be swept clean mm. and a lot of these things are that's what's happening it's this idea that everything in our society is broken and it's racist so the only way to move into our utopia is to wipe this wipe the old site clean and rebuild it from the ashes so i i think it's a number of different things i mean there's plenty there's plenty of black people who are who are on this train as well and who are doing the same thing um and i i think it's a i think it's a combination of whether it personally benefits them or it's financially or psychically or, or whenever it may be um the or way they actually believe it and uh real quick i want to i want to tell you an allegory by ken minogue <laughs> he, he's a he was a philosopher from australia but it gives insight into the way that some of these people think and it's the allegory is called saint george the dragon slayer in retirement and i don't know if you've ever heard of it before but no i saint george yeah so saint saint george was this prolific dragon slayer and he just played all the he played all the dragons in the land he was this big hero the, the villagers loved him he was uh he was a celebrity he was basically medieval justin bieber right so <laughs> he, was, <laughs> so he was, he's this prolific dragon slayer but then he slays all the dragons in the land there's no more dragons so he can retire so he goes to retirement he's sitting at home and he starts to have this identity crisis he, he because he's so deeply identified with slaying dragons he doesn't know who he is now and it's like he has no purpose no meaning he doesn't know what to do and but he looked outside and what does he see miraculously there's a dragon so he grabs his sword and his shield and runs outside and plays the dragon and then suddenly he looks around and there's dragon everywhere there's there's dragons that bark there's dragons that quack there's dragons with antlers there, there's dragons who claim to be villagers there's and he's played them all and then eventually he's seen swinging his sword at thin air proclaiming it to be the fiercest dragon of them all ah but i i find that to be such a profound allegory about what's going on in in progressivism and critical race theory specifically because these people have so deeply identified themselves with fighting oppression and fighting the dragons of racism that when it's not there when it's five men black memphis cops beating up a black guy and there's no racism to be found they they can still somehow see a dragon they can still somehow say yes i am the dragon slayer and they grab their sword and go out and slay it because that's their identity and they have to protect it at all costs It can be really tough being a conservative woman in culture today, especially if your men walk like chicken. We deal with nonstop propaganda at work, school, and in pop culture telling us that we hate ourselves for valuing faith, family, and freedom. And when it comes to finding non-woke beauty brands, it can seem almost impossible. So when I tried Nimi Skincare for the first time two years ago, I was so relieved to find a skincare company that not only shared my values, but had amazing ingredients like hyaluronic acid, 
peptides, AHAs, and vitamin C that actually work. My uncomfortably dry skin instantly felt more hydrated and smoother, and I loved that my skin didn't just absorb it all immediately on contact, leaving me feeling dehydrated for the rest of the day like it does with other skincare brands. Nimi Skincare is made in the USA, and their factory is women-owned and operated at a state-of-the-art FDA-certified facility in Oregon. Service to others is a core value of Nimi, so I I really like this. 1% of all products sold goes to American causes for women and girls that share their values, like girls on the run and women of faith. Whether you want to brighten, prevent aging, or hydrate, Nimi Skincare has you covered, and you can try them with 10% off using my code today. Go to NimiSkincare.com and use code Alex Clark to get 10% off your order. That's N I M I Skincare.com and use code Alex Clark for 10% off. Or click the link in the description. You're right. That is the perfect allegory for this. And your new book, Leonidas Johnson, is called Raising Victims. What are some ways that we can permanently expel critical race theory and racial sensitivity training from society? We have to get these people out of power. That's get it out of power and influence. Uh, Talking about it, standing. First thing I would say too is their strength in numbers. A lot of times people feel like they're isolated when they and they're scared to speak up. I get all ty- all kinds of people telling me like I don't know what to say or I'm scared to speak out because I don't want to lose my job or I don't want people to attack me. And those are valid. Those are valid fears because that's happened to people before. Um, and I know people have lost people lost their jobs for even questioning the George Floyd issue, right? So I mean, it, it's it's a, a it's a legitimate fear. I, I get it, but there's strength in numbers. So the more and more people that speak out against it, then the the more effective it will be, and the more more courage people will have. And it reminds me of there's there was a uh, I, I think it was a fair or something. There was a ride that was falling over, and nobody was helping. Like there were people on this ride, and it wasn't a big ride, but it was. I mean, it would hurt them, and it was starting to fall. It was starting to tip. And but one man ran over and grabbed the, the grabbed the side of it to hold it up. And then finally, after he did that, all kinds of people ran over there to, to help hold it. And but it took that one man with courage to stand up and say, uh, we have to do something here because this isn't right in order for everybody else to have courage. And sometimes you have to be that first person. So I say there's strength in numbers. And then the other thing is you have to root it out. You have to uh, find where these ideas are being pushed. And, and do whatever you have to do to try to get those people out of power and influence. And for, for example, let's say public school. If you go to school board meetings, so a lot of parents have been doing that, make your voice heard, uh, stand up with other parents, do petitions, uh, just be loud because the activists are going to be loud and we need to be loud. Uh, and the other thing too is take your kids out of public school if you can. Remove the influence. Uh, we homeschool our kids. Uh, we've been blessed to be able to do that. I, I recognize not everybody can do that, but if you can, uh, I, I would recommend it because the the only way that they that this can succeed is if we number one, if we don't shine light on it because they operate in darkness, and that's the only way that they can get their ideas through is if people don't know what's happening. And so, if they don't shine light on it, and number two, if we don't remove their influence. Because they've strategically placed themselves in places of influence. And so it's our job to both shine the light on it and to remove that influence. And, you know, just just know your stuff and, and go out and fight. And your new book, Raising Victims, is going to help people do that. Congratulations, by the way. It is out this week. So tell everybody where yes. they can find you and the book. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Audible, if you, if you want to do audiobooks. And pretty much anywhere you get your books, you can find it. And uh, you can also uh, go to my website at leonidasjohnson.com. And you can find my podcast, Informed Dissent, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Leonidas, thank you so much for your courage and your voice in the culture war. Thanks for coming on The Spillover. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate you. I know it can be really intimidating to kind of bring up more emotionally charged topics like race and racism when it comes to debating our liberal friends. So 
I really did want to have somebody that was an expert on this. And also, that is Black themselves to kind of speak on it. And I thought a lot of his answers were really helpful and really interesting and insightful. I'm very excited to read his brand new book. If you liked this episode, you've got to go back and listen to my episode with Daryl Davis from November. He infiltrated the KKK as a Black man and has changed hundreds of minds. He firmly believes in free speech, but he is definitely a classical liberal, so you can hear that difference in opinion on the issues of race in America in contrast to Leonidas. His story, however, is really powerful. That is season three, episode 17. The Spillover is back next Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. You can always watch the episodes on the Politics YouTube channel, so subscribe there. And next week is our special Valentine's Day episode. We are going full-blown into relationships, dating, marriages with a very, very, very special couple that a lot of you follow, know, and love. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it. Bye. Bye.